again and welcome to lesson number nine which has titled the performative body and the totalitarian mind so in this lesson we will continue what we talked in the lesson before uh, with this performative uh, aspect and as I had previously mentioned um, this kind of way of working with the body and rhythm as a way to create a psychological synchronism with the viewer was appropriated by the propaganda machinery of many totalitarian uh, regimes and then of course also this was also connected to architecture and to interior design especially through uh, stage design but also through building and so in this chapter we will go a little bit uh, deeper on this on this uh, topic so we start by referencing the work of Johanny Palasma, who also wrote on this topic in his book uh, The Architecture of Image, Existential Space in Cinema. Palasma quotes uh, authors such as Alfred Hitchcock, who consciously manipulated the viewer's gaze through a very well calculated placement of elements in the setting, choice of camera shots and of course acting. Palasma, in his book The Eyes of the Skin, Architecture in the Senses, cites uh, Henri Bergson on the same subject to state that what separates architecture from the other arts while configuring man's existential space is the possibility of corporeal action and reaction. Likewise, we are forced to acknowledge that such techniques were also applied in the field of propaganda uh, for example, during the Nazi uh, regime, which expressed its narrative through film, but also through the intense and highly emotional manipulation of the masses, through speech, and of course the manifestation of the greatness of the Third Reich, so through its uh, grandiose uh, architecture, in stark contrast to the humble uh, human scale. The architecture of the Third Reich uh, consciously played with human proportions, manipulating simple elements, mostly through scale, exaggerating the height of steps, the height and width of door frames, and even the necessary effort that was uh, uh, made to turn a doorknob. Uh, Munich's Haus der Kunst by Paul Ludwig Trost, built in 1937, is one example of how a building can express through its use um, how it can show uh, through through direct contrast the fragility of the human body through a, a building narrative which glorifies bodily strength endurance and even immortality uh, so for uh, images of uh, housing kunst please take a look at figures 9.1 and 9.2 uh, this is an architecture made for gods and not for humans an interesting detail lies in the fact that Trost happened to be known for his extreme tallness, which brings back thoughts about Adolf Loos, for example, and his affinities of uh, aesthetical appreciation according to um, this kind of human standards. Although seemingly far-fetched, of course, it's not illogical to assume that Trost, as an, as an author and as an architect, uh, and his own embodied uh, condition played an important role in his aesthetical choices and of course uh, influenced uh, his worldview. A strong tall man doesn't have the same perception of space as a child or as an aged uh, person. But of course in this case there was a very strong ideological component. Trust had come exactly from the same school of thought as Peter Behrens and uh, Gropius who all reacted against the ornamental style of the Jugendstil, defending an essential architectural approach that targeted the values of genuine simplicity and a return to the essence of architecture. Although while Behrens would evolve from a first architectural approach that is closer to the values of the Gesamtkunstwerk or the total artwork, through his connections with the Deutsche Werkbund to the simplicity and efficiency necessary for the design of a factory and the corporate identity of a brand like AEG, IG, Peter Behrens eventually converted also to Nazi ideology as Gropius followed an opposite route. After replacing Henri van der Velde in the School of Arts and Crafts in Weimar, Gropius transformed it into the Bauhaus, which later led to his exile in the United States, 
due to his left-wing influence in the ideological management of, of the school and his interest in designing buildings which were concerned with the health of the working class. And of course, this was incompatible with Nazi uh, ideology. So for an example of uh, Peter Behrendt's uh, design, please take a look at figure 9.3. Uh, it's the IAG Turbine Factory building. The praise of the Pythagorean tradition, so going back to this topic of uh, human body and proportion, and we already in the last lesson, we talked about uh, Oskar Schlemmer, and this was also again this uh, idea of this classical idea of, of proportion was also recovered um, recovered now the praise of the pythagorean tradition was continued by le corbusier with the modular who considered mathematics as the majestic substructure conceived by man to grant him comprehension comprehension of the universe the modular was devised as a measuring tool that systematizes the mathematical wisdom of the Pythagorean triad and duality and the Fibonacci sequence, and its creator hoped that it could relocate architecture in relation to the human scale, as it was based on the systems of proportions of the human body, the golden section and the Vitruvian man. To Le Corbusier, it would be a tuned measuring instrument that, together with the technical means of his time, could make the good easy and the bad difficult, facing the challenges and the growing complexity of the machine age. Le Corbusier wanted to express in his work the belief that only the architect can strike the balance between man and his environment, man as a psychophysiology and his environment as nature and cosmos, a rather holistic view that also recalls humanist thinking and a concern for ecological values. Paradoxically, being the creator of a system of rules that recalls many Renaissance authors, such as Alberti, that we mentioned in one of the first lessons, who considered the eye as the supreme organ of perception, Le Corbusier states in his final considerations in the modular that I have only stayed within the realm of concrete things, the field of human psychophysiology. I have concerned myself only with objects falling under the jurisdiction of the eye avoiding any sorcery of the Renaissance. So, of course, Le Corbusier, we start talking about Le Corbusier because uh, he was obviously very interested in this kind of... Uh, he was interested in an architecture which was connected to the human body, but at the same time, he was very interested in this uh, idea of, of the ideal body, the ideal standard. And so the modular was uh, designed as to be a tool that would bring the new ideal standard for, for the new world, but also meant, uh, based on his idea of the new man. So Le Corbusier was, of course, also very influenced by Corbe Culture, as we mentioned in the lesson before. But uh, he applied this idea of the new man also to himself. Uh, so he changed his name and he uh, he was very sportive and he was very interested in this uh, idea of, of uh, using his own body as a scale and a measure for the new world. Also as his creative um, impulse uh, to, to leave his own mark in the world. Le Corbusier's suspicion of the Renaissance's architects was based on the understanding that their architecture was more a product of subjective and individual quests than a commitment to a social or universal philosophy. So Le Corbusier was really interested in this universal recipe or the universal measure that would make the world uh, a, better, a better place, more, more civilized place. Ironically, ironically, his generic understanding of the universal man as an inflexible tabula rasa standard that despised cultural, genre, gender and emotional differences would be the cause of the modular's decline, seen as a static, closed and abstract representation of a man. In Palasma's words, the modernist idiom has not generally been able to penetrate the surface of popular taste and values it has housed the intellect and the eye, but it has left the body and the other senses, as well as our memories, imagination and dreams, homeless. 
The metaphor of the well-tuned Swiss clock could be applied to Le Corbusier's idealization of the modular and architecture, as his ha father happened to be a craftsman specialized in the manufacturing of glass for clock screens, a craft the young Jean Ré would also learn in his youth. Le Corbusier refers many times about aesthetics as well-tuned instruments, and to a certain extent, the Zeitgeist applied this notion to an increasingly growing body culture in Germany, specifically in the Weimar Republic, what would be defined as Körperkultur. Le Corbusier would take this interest in the human body as a source of spiritual transformation and self-improvement, being interested in primitivism, nudism, and direct contact with nature. Eventually, this stubbornness would lead also to his tragic death, by drowning at the age of 65 in result of going for a swim in spite of his doctor's advice. Le Corbusier's interest in body culture was also a vital part of his architectural and urban agenda. So many, many projects of uh, Le Corbusier uh, display specific areas planned as stations for exercise and to allow the body to be kept fit, healthy and self-sufficient. This matched the ideology of Le Corbusier's time the empowerment of the individual through the knowledge and maintenance of his own body. Of course, this would be taken to extremes after the economic crisis which led to the Second World War, where such corporeal practices were induced in education and propaganda, leading to mass movements and the suppression of individual will through the submission of the collective of totalitarian regimes. Here, emotion played a key part as nations would tend to follow apparently strong leaders whose political agenda staged and incorporated a sense of regained strength, structure and order. Such display of power had led to the disastrous consequences of the Second World War and would again strike with the energetic crisis of the 70s and the first collapse of the social system as governed by pure capitalism. Interestingly enough, we are experiencing a very similar situation now. If one recalls Le Corbusier's modular, and specifically its application in works such as the Petit Cabanon, or most importantly, the design of the apartments of his Unité d'Habitation, one is surprised to find out through direct experience that although these works are usually depicted in photography as just as grandiose in scale as the architectural contributions of the Third Reich, not less remarkably by the Soviets, Le Corbusier's architecture reveals through the manipulation of scale that in fact he was not a tall man. In Palasma's writings, Le Corbusier's architecture is usually criticized for its disregard for the human scale or even a certain sterile atmosphere. Anyhow, just a moment, I was just checking because there's an image coming. Anyhow, one must note that before designing the modular, which is from 1954, Le Corbusier had expressed in L'Esprit Nouveau in 1925, so some time before, the need for rules in architecture based both in scientific knowledge and also art and experiment, a scientific aesthetics that joined reason and intuition. So please take a look for an image of the modular to figure 9.4. So you probably remember in the last lesson when we spoke about, for example, at the Bauhaus and we spoke about Kandinsky and how Kandinsky was also uh, as an artist, but also as a mentor at the Bauhaus, as an uh, educator, he was interested in this uh, idea of understanding aesthetics through science. And this, of course, has a connection to phenomenology but also a connection to uh, psychology, to understand how aesthetic phenomena can be explained scientifically. Le Corbusier's proposal for a scientific aesthetics would be based on his studies in cubist painting and sculpture and the musical concepts of harmony as applied to architecture in the pursuit of the fourth dimension the moment of boundless freedom brought about by an exceptionally happy consonance of the plastic means applied in a work of art, being the key to aesthetic emotion, a function of the architectural space. This interest in the topic of harmony makes sense, since Le Corbusier's brother, 
was a practitioner and teacher of the Dalcozy method and their mother was a musician herself. So you remember from last lesson when I mentioned that Le Corbusier's brother was also participating in the as a uh, in the community of uh, Hellerau. Uh, he was an instructor of eurythmics of the Dalcozy method and uh, he was also a musician. So Le Corbusier and his family, he was exposed to, to this uh, influence and this was not a separated universe for him and of course has influenced him as an architect and a designer and uh, or maybe most importantly as a painter. But also it reveals Le Corbusier's obsession with the idea of harmony and, and rhythm and proportion, which was a direct translation from music. Even though the modular as a system of rules wasn't complex enough to deal with the challenges of its time, reducing them exclusively to a problem of measurement and efficiency, and also being a tailor-made tool conceived to the uses of its maker's body and uh, creative desires, the use of the modular was intended to open the path for the architect to work with more assurance, letting intuition flow and having a tool that with some guides that make creativity and art easier. It was also Le Corbusier's belief that as an architect, he had the ethical and professional duty to teach people how to live better lives, which led to failures in some specific cases, for example, in India and in Chandigarh, where the context and cultural habits would clash dramatically with the creator's uh, idealism. Now we make a parallel, we zoom out a little bit from Le Corbusier and, and we make a reference uh, to this idea of how, of how in general the modern movement and, and the architecture that was shaped by the modern movement somehow uh, made a very specific part uh, mark in the, in the world and in the architecture of the 20th century. So now we will make a critique uh, uh, a critique on this uh, impact. So in the text, uh, The World as Design, which is by Otto Eicher, he states, the world we live is the world we make. And it makes us reflect on the consequences of human intervention in the built environment, in the direct lives of its inhabitants, revealing the world as the result of good and bad interventions in confrontation. Otel Archer points the finger at what man recognizes as a conditioning of a whole way of life and not simply a design. So that when we are designing, we are not simply putting things senselessly in the world. We are through building and through design, you are influencing directly how life unfolds. The complexity of design in architecture has to do with the difficulty of combining a number of factor factors that determine the success or failure of the production of objects that will constitute reality. Each design is subject to conditions that do not depend only on the proposal of the architect, but mainly to solve more or less concrete problems and demands of society. In this context, there is often a large distance in the way a designer interprets such, such problems and the definition of a solution in the design itself. Many times we as designers are forced to confront ourselves with interventions that are inappropriate, both from an urban point of view and in terms of their social implications. The problem of the architect as a creator, according to the modernist paradigm, which is what we are discussing today, is addressed as a central theme in The Fountainhead, a film by American director King Vidar, based on the novel by Ayn Rand. The main character, the architect Howard Rourke, is an idealist young architect who prefers to fight in anonymity to compromise his artistic and personal vision. Here we identify, uh, I definitely recommend that you watch uh, The Fountainhead if you now, for example, have have some time or if you have the opportunity, um, watch The Fountainhead and here in this film and in the story we can clearly identify traces of these modernist uh, principles and the role of the architect which is presented at the time and we can find parallels in this time of creative male creative uh, persona and their idiosyncrasies we can find many parallels 
with the star architect of, of, the, of um, the modernist star architect, for example, Mies van der Rohe, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, but of course also Le Corbusier. So in the film, at one point, the main character, the architect Rourke, is confronted with changes that were introduced by the city in one of his main designs without his uh, authorization. In retaliation to the theft of the integrity of his work, Rourke decides to destroy it by blasting it. Rourke goes on trial for destroying public property and refutes by claiming the importance of the value of the self and the individual's need to remain true to one's beliefs, especially as a, as a creator. So for some uh, interesting um, snapshots uh, of, of the Fountainhead with some, some titles of the of the text that's going on, please take a look at figures uh, 9.5 and 9.6, where you have here Mr. Rourke. The commission is your, yours. The board of directors decided to approve the project, but we want you to adapt your building like this. So Rourke had a clear vision as a modernist, modernist building, and the commission wanted him to adapt to add a portico with a very uh, neoclassical uh, look um, so that there would be a touch of the old and a touch of the new uh, and of course the architect work was not pleased because it spoiled his modernist ideal of what architecture should look like um, and he argues no this is not possible a building has to have integrity just like a man and in this case the word man is used and not the word human because it's also, of course, this uh, uh, very uh, patriarchal idea of a creator as a man, uh, and and this idea of the of, of integrity as a man, as a, as an inflexibility uh, and uh, and rigidity to to one's principles. And the city counter arguments, city, uh, but we can't depart from the popular forms of architecture since they would be too far from from uh, the public uh, taste. Uh, why can we take chances? Why should we take any chances when we can stay in the middle? So this is an interesting discussion because we still we deal with this question. We deal with this question all the time with this fine line between uh, creative freedom between breaking free from old forms which are uh, saturated from the past uh, but also the public's uh, resistance to to what can be new um, and of course the difficulty that can happen when when we as authors have to have to adjust to to situations which we might feel might compromise our creative vision so i definitely recommend that you watch the the fountainhead and take some time to think about the, the topics. In this context, we are talking about it in the context of, as an example of the principles of modern movement uh, and of this really radical approach of uh, completely ignoring any um, historical or building tradition and just rebuilding the world uh, completely new uh, and, and setting a completely new standard of, of modernity. So the problem that arises in the film still has great relevance today in the sense that explores the confrontation that always exists between the creative act of design, the collective taste and the fulfillment of necessary requirements for society. However, the apology of the architect as the god, who both has the power to create and destroy, may be symptomatic of some of the arrogance that eventually contaminated the good intentions of the main authors of the modern movement. Such beliefs in one's absolute knowledge led to an attitude which subdued the collective imposition of an idealized model of life, which relied on the blind faith in technology and the abundance of energy and natural uh, resources. According to authors like Aisha and uh, Palasma, this attitude may have progressively led to a dehumanization of architecture. The way of life that modernism aimed to establish was intended to organize all human activity as an individual was understood as part of a greater machine. Taylorization and the factory logic set existence at all scales and types of activity in a systematic way, 
based on tasks in serial production, characteristic of industrialization. You remember when we talked about Taylorization before. In another film, Charlie Chaplin has addressed such uh, issues. Uh, for example, in, in the 1936 film A Modern Times, in which through his characteristic humor, he warns against the standardization and mechanization of life, which may steal one's uh, individuality. The sketch in which a factory worker emerges as a guinea pig to test a machine for feeding workers is probably one of the most serious in the history of cinema, comic but at the same time frightening and cannily contemporary since still nowadays not only work but almost every aspect of our life such as uh, nutrition and food is seen as dependent on technology. Even more strangely, many people would actually desire to be able to rely on such technologies more and more in order to save as much physical effort as possible. Um, now we are also in a paradoxical situation because actually if it wouldn't be for uh, technology uh, and we are now experiencing this really deep um, crisis due to the due to the corona uh, pandemic uh, and if it wouldn't we wouldn't have the technological means at the moment many people would not be able to work uh, at all so this is also a, a paradox that we are that we are experiencing right now um, so I would also recommend, and I think you can find it on YouTube when you have some time, you can put it on your list of things that you should see to develop your awareness of the world. Please take a look at uh, Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. Uh, it's a really interesting movie that really deals with the topic of modernity and with the topic of industrialization. Um, and so for an, just a snapshot of this um of this operary feeding machine sketch, please take a look at figure uh, 9.8. It's almost unthinkable nowadays to live in what are called the civilized world without objects such as a refrigerator, a stove or a tap without running water. However, the energy and economic crisis, which happened in the 70s and now we are experiencing excessive crisis, we also had an immobilian crisis from 2008 and now we are experiencing another crisis, the Corona crisis. They have, and, and of course we have the larger crisis of sustainability and this is directly addressing the question of the resources. Um, and so these crises have brought attention to the value of sustainability and are raising the issue that perhaps one day these gestures of acquired comfort may disappear if solutions and concrete action are not taken. We can even ponder if contemporary culture is prepared to accept that perhaps these notions of comfort we have could be in the long term, term compromising our existence as human beings. Nowadays it is possible to see that the consequences of a passive, technologically dependent way of life based on monotonous repetition of tasks and the effects that this can have in one's quality of life. According to statistics, a series of physical and psychological disorders, such as obesity, musculoskeletal disorders and depression, are reaching large numbers of the world population with increasing incidence in younger generations. Similarly to the effects of the Industrial Revolution, with the introduction of digital technologies in daily life, both work-related and for leisure, the human body is rendered more and more docile or more and more passive and um, many people uh, experience a collective feeling of numbness. Such effects can also be directly seen uh, in, in, in also in our profession, in the profession of architecture, uh, since we, we work a lot with the computer and, and of course it's, uh, it's a very constraining for the body, very constraining way of work that has direct implications uh, in our bodies. But this is a question, that, uh, this is some issues that I am addressing directly in my course on ergonomics. If you are curious, you can also take a look at the videos, but it's just a parallel that I am doing here. The current digital tools, of course, offer many possibilities. Um, 
But we also have to think what regards contemporary culture of architecture and uh, urbanism. And we can see that although highly criticized in the 70s and the 80s, modernist architecture has left strong ghosts of, of, uh, of these uh, ideal uh, heroes, architecture heroes, for example, like Le Corbusier, whose works are still copied and transmitted in a mimetic imitation uh, attitude, not so different from what in the 19th century was called the Beaux-Arts model of, of education. Such a perpetuation of the modernist style is supported by a generalized mediatized attention that is given to the architect as a persona and of a sort of worship of visual images, which according to Palasma is uh, propagated by contemporary media. Architecture then is more focused on creation of visual images rather than experiences, playing along with the demands of the market, as architecture offices sometimes can't afford to make a stand, which would imply compromising the economic stability of the managers and workers. Um, This is a critique of, of how uh, this attitude from a uh, modern movement of, of, of creating uh, architecture and designing architecture or interior space in a way that is very visually centered and not so much on uh, human experience. And, and in the, recently um, it also had a, a kind of revival due to the presence to the presence of technology and to the way their architecture is communicated and also competitions are done which are very visually uh, visually oriented so through the the ways of architectural representation that we use that take this focus of architecture away from experience and more to the visual and to the communication so often clients and investors wish to see the images which are advertised uh, come true Later coming to the confrontation that such designs sometimes are not flexible enough to accommodate change or simply pass the challenge of time. Just like a tailor-made suit won't probably fit forever uh, to an owner's body and its needs, perhaps this kind of architecture can become closer to an, architect to an architectural corset after some time instead of the embodiment of a private space of flexibility, change and freedom. And this kind of attributes perhaps could turn a house into a home and make the difference between um, architecture and mere uh, construction. There is the work of uh, now, now returning to modernism after making this parallel with modernists, uh, still long during modernist influence in contemporary architecture. Uh, contemporary artist Nuno Sera for example, has explored in his uh, work about the unité d'habitation uh, of Berlin by Le Corbusier, and he has created a, a series of work called Ghosts, which is a testament to the coolness and aggressiveness of a building, this unité d'habitation, uh, of a building which was crystallized an architectural icon of uh, modernism and a specific way of life. Uh, paradoxically, with such designs, such as the Unité d'Habitation, Le Corbusier had the intention of uniting men to the cosmos. Therefore, the building's proportions were based on the proportions of the human body, according to the modular. The problem of such a simplified reading of the human body's purely metric and mechanical aspects as well as the purely visual understanding of the experience of architecture, was revealed by Sera's work through the coldness and impersonality of the spaces the artist explores, emphasizing the confrontation between such spaces and the fragility of the human body. Uh, Nuno Sera uses photographs and videos that show corridors that remember morgues, in which the body wanders like a ghost, or through the contrast between the blood of a mutilated or perhaps suicidal body and the whiteness of the ground, humanizing tragically and intentionally is a, a septic space. So for a depiction of this uh, work by Nuno Sera, please take a look at figure 9.9, uh, which is a, a, it's a film and it's, it's a uh, um, fictional narrative which the film shows. 
uh, that that develops in this uh, video of, of the installation of Nunusera, but uh, it shows how the space uh, from the un uh, Unité d'Habitation uh, really can convey this really cold, uh, impersonal, uh, impersonal relationship to the human body and to experience. So another author in the 60s and 70s who really criticized the architecture of the modern movement was Christopher Alexander. And he presented a theory based on ecology and cybernetics, which explains the failure of, city, of the cities he calls artificial, including Colombia, Tokyo or Brasilia. So these, these were cities that really follow these modernist uh, principles. Alexander states that another concept preferred by the theoretical proposals of the Siam is the separation between leisure and the rest from other cities, from other activities. This attitude was crystallized in our artificial cities, for example, in the typology of the playground, which was paved and fenced, so closed, coming from inflexible and rather dualistic ideas that play exists as an isolated concept in the mind. Alexander continues to argue that such places have nothing to do with what is the nature of playing, which can happen both inside and outside the home, in an abandoned building or by the river. These are activities which form systems with objects and other systems of the city. Therefore, there is an interference between one and the other. This is what happens in a natural city where a child can take ownership of their surroundings and where the complexity necessary to life is generated. So for an example, please take a look at figures 9.10 and 9.11. These are images from uh, Le Corbusier's uh, Unité d'Habitation. And um, you can see, for example, in figure 9.10 that we have this room which is the room where the children were assigned to play and this is very uh, telling and characteristic of uh, the modernist attitude that everything had its own place and was compartmentalized and organized and in very specific areas so zoning in terms of urban design and also in the house and so so um, a very rational systematization an organization of uh, daily life and in the 60s and 70s Christopher Alexander really felt the need to make to make a critique and to propose this idea that in a natural city and he gave the examples for example of, of historical historical cities where through the complexity of buildings which were done in different time periods for example in the medieval city historical city and so on that these natural cities actually because they had the complexity of different times and because they had to adapt to different uses through time had the flexibility and had and offered more creative uh, possibilities than these highly compartmentalized very rigid uh, design programs uh, proposed by the uh, modern movement so the theory developed by christopher uh, alexander finds its most obvious representation in the films for example of jacques tati you probably heard about especially the films mon uncle and playtime where the clash between the old and the modern city as well as the uns uh, unsuitability to a systematized way of life is always present. By analyzing the work of Le Corbusier, and in particular through the photographs showing the child ownership of the proposed spaces to play in the inauguration of the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, so this is in figure 9.11, uh, we can remember the work of Jacques Tati and especially Mon Uncle in which uh, children or, for example, the main character, uh, Monsieur Hulot, um, appear as unfit and unsuited to the rigidity of modern architecture. And I, I, if you have not seen uh, the films of Jacques Tati, you have to, as an architect or interior designer, uh, you, you have to see these movies because they are a wonderful critique of, of the, some of the failures of uh, modern movement. And, uh, for example, in figure 9.12, we have here a screenshot. And this is a child in a, in a house, which is like a modernist house. 
and this child obviously has real trouble understanding how this house works uh, is this a chair how do i use it and feels lost and confused all the time with all these uh, extremely sophisticated designs in a house in which he he doesn't know how to play uh, who do, which does not stimulate him to play at all and which has so many rules of what can and cannot be done that basically doesn't allow the child to be a, ch a child as he is um, the other example is uh, the main character Monsieur Hulot and he's visiting an office he goes in an escalator and he's visiting an office and he sees it from the top uh, the people working in these cubicles everyone uh, right in, in, in the same uh, cubicle working exactly in the same uh, setting and this is a situation which is familiar for how many of us uh, work but the way it's depicted in the movie it really shows um, how often uh, how often um, how oftenly this is an absurd and also a dystopian situation to live and to work in so Jacques Tati really brings attention to the to the human body and to the um, and to the harshness of such such a built uh, environment which has nothing to do with humans natural uh, interaction so it would take almost a century to develop technologies that would allow us to do better simulations and um, and try to understand better how the built environment, architecture and interior space, how it directly affects the, the dwellers and how it directly affects the human body and mind. Still, although we now have tools and we have ways of understanding uh, how this um, can happen, uh, we still, uh, to understand how how the body reacts to the environment from, from the inside. Um, now we also live the paradox of, of trying to understand the danger that we have because we have now such tools, the tools that also the architects such as Le Corbusier were looking for the, to make this scientific aesthetic. Uh, if we are not also getting closer to this idea of the totalit modernist idea of the totalitarian architect who can find the rules of how the human body and brain works and then make a manual and teach people uh, how, how to live their lives and, and, and of course the ethical considerations that come from this. Uh, Le Corbusier had stated in the text in the modular that having a tuned instrument isn't enough to generate harmony it's necessary to use it with rules the product of analysis and painstaking study which are evolved on the basis of a problem well stated in the final analysis a rule is ex established by experimentation so there's still a lot of work to do although nowadays we do have tools that allow us or promise to allow us to understand better how the human and body um, are affected and affect uh, the built environment uh, but for we will arrive at this uh, later we are almost at the end of our of our cycle of uh, lectures and um, yeah so this was the end of lecture number nine we will have uh, still lecture number 10 and 11 which will give you a little bit more theory so we will get more and more deeper into con contemporary uh, theories of uh, of architecture so just uh, a short ending of the history of the 20th century with the 60s uh, from the 60s and 70s until the beginning of the 21st century and then we will have a roundup lesson number 12 I will give you a list of recommendations of books which is not now for the course it's for you for your um, development as future architects and designers if you are interested and I will give you more an overview on this topic of uh, on the topic of neuroscience for architecture uh, because this is really changing the way um, theory of architecture is developing nowadays and it's also changing the, the way we design and we build so yeah until the next lesson and thank you for your attention <laughs>